This is part two of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please listen with an open mind. Thank you for listening. The Seven Visitors of Facius Cardan. Throughout medieval times, a major current of thought distinct from official religion existed, culminating in the works of the alchemists and hermetists. Among such groups were some of the early scientists and men remarkable for the strength of their independent thinking and for their adventurous lives, such as Paracelsus. The nature of the mysterious beings dressed in shiny garments or covered with dark hair intrigued these men intensely. They were the first to relate these strange beings to the creatures described in the Bible and in the writings of the early Kabbalists. According to biblical writers, the heavenly hierarchy includes beings of human form called cherubim, a name that in Hebrew means full of knowledge. Ezekiel describes them in the following terms, their appearance was like burning coals of fire, and like the appearance of lamps, it went up and down among the living creatures, and the fire was bright, and out of the fire went forth lightning. Are the mysterious creatures who fly through the sky and land in their cloud ships, Agabar's authority notwithstanding, of the same race as the angels? Ask the old philosophers. No, because they are mortal. A book entitled Entrechon sur les sciences secretes notes, the Hebrews used to call these beings who are between the angels and Mansadim, and the Greeks, transposing the letters and adding but one syllable, called them daimonas. Among the ancient philosophers these demons were held to be an aerial race, ruling over the elements, mortal, engendering, and unknown in this century to those who rarely seek truth in her ancient dwelling place, which is to say, in the Kabbalah and in the theology of the Hebrews, who possess the special art of holding communion with that aerial people and of conversing with all these inhabitants of the air. Plutarch even had a complete theory on the nature of these beings. According to A. H. Clough, he thinks it absurd that there should be no mean between the two extremes of an immortal and a mortal being, that there cannot be in nature so vast a flaw, without some intermediate kind of life, partaking of them both. As, therefore, we find the intercourse between the soul and the body to be made by the animal spirits, so between divinity and humanity there is this species of demons. It is not surprising, then, to find that the philosophers disagreed with Agabar on the nature of the three men and the woman who were captured by the mob and lions, the famous Kabbalist at Achaeus, in the reign of your Papan, took it into his head to convince the world that the elements are inhabited by those peoples whose nature I have just described to you. The expedient of which he bethought himself was to advise the sylphs to show themselves in the air to everybody, they did so sumptuously. These beings were seen in the air in human form, sometimes in battle array marching in good order, halting under arms, or encamped beneath magnificent tents, sometimes on wonderfully constructed aerial ships, whose flying squadrons roved at the will of the zephyrs. What happened? Do you suppose that ignorant age would so much as reason as to the nature of these marvelous spectacles? The people straightway believed that sorcerers had taken possession of the air for the purpose of raising tempest and bringing hail upon their crops. The learned theologians and jurists were soon of the same opinion as the masses. The emperor believed it as well, and this ridiculous chimera went so far that the wise Charlemagne, and after him Louis the Debonair, imposed grievous penalties upon all these supposed tyrants of the air. Now comes an account of outright contact, which I quote from the same book, Entrechon sur les sciences secrets, the sylphs seen the populace, the peasants and even the crowned heads thus alarmed against them determined to dissipate the bad opinion people had of their innocent fleet by carrying off men from every locality and showing them their beautiful women, their republic and their manner of government, and then setting them down again on earth in diverse parts of the world. They carried out their plan. The people who saw these men as they were descending came running from every direction, convinced beforehand that they were sorcerers who had separated from their companions in order to come and scatter poisons on the fruit and in the springs. Carried away by the frenzy with which such fancies inspired them, they hurried these innocents off to the torture. The great number of them who were put to death by fire and water throughout the kingdom is incredible. The most extraordinary case involved the abduction of four people and their return to earth. One day, among other instances, it chanced at Lyons that three men and a woman were seen descending from these aerial ships. The entire city gathered about them crying out they were magicians and were sent by Grimaldus, Duke of Beneventum, Charlemagne's enemy, to destroy the French harvest. 
In vain the four innocents sought to vindicate themselves by saying that they were their own country folk, and had been carried away a short time since by miraculous men who had shown them unheard of marvels, and had desired to give them an account of what they had seen. The frenzied populace paid no heed to their defense, and were on the point of casting them into the fire, when the worthy Agabar, Bishop of Lyons, who having been a monk in that city had acquired considerable authority there, came running at the noise, and having heard the accusations of the people and the defense of the accused, gravely pronounced that both one and the other were false. That it was not true that these men had fallen from the sky, and that what they said they had seen there was impossible. The people believed what their good father Agabar said rather than their own eyes, were pacified, set at liberty the four ambassadors of the sylphs, and received with wonder the book which Agabar wrote to confirm the judgment which he had pronounced. Thus the testimony of these four witnesses was rendered vain. Such stories were so well established during the Middle Ages that the problem of communicating with the elementals became a major preoccupation of the hermetic adepts and an important part of their philosophy. Paracelsus wrote an entire book on the nature of these beings, but he took great pains to warn the reader of the dangers of an association with them, I do not want to say here, because of the ills which might befall those who would try it, through which compact one associates with these beings, thanks to which compact they appear to us and speak to us. And in his treatise entitled Why These Beings Appear to Us, he presented the following ingenious theory, everything God creates manifests itself to man sooner or later. Sometimes God confronts him with the devil and the spirits in order to convince him of their existence. From the top of heaven, he also sends the angels, his servants. Thus these beings appear to us, not in order to stay among us or become allied to us, but in order for us to become able to understand them. These apparitions are scarce, to tell the truth. But why should it be otherwise? Is it not enough for one of us to see an angel? in order for all of us to believe in the other angels. Paracelsus was probably born in 1493, and only two years earlier Facius Cardan had recorded his observation of seven strange visitors directly related to the creatures of the elements who would be so puzzling to the great philosopher. The incident is preserved in the writings of his son, Jerome Cardan, 1501-1576, who is well known to us today as a mathematician. Jerome Cardan lived in Milan and was not only a mathematician but also an occultist and a physician. In his book De Subtilitate, Cardan explains that he had often heard his father tell the particular story and finally searched for his record of the event, which read as follows, August 13, 1491. When I had completed the customary rites, at about the twentieth hour of the day, seven men duly appeared to me clothed in silken garments, resembling Greek togas, and wearing, as it were, shining shoes. The undergarments beneath their glistening and ruddy breastplates seemed to be wrought of crimson and were of extraordinary glory and beauty. Nevertheless all were not dressed in this fashion, but only two who seemed to be of noble rank than the others. The taller of them who was of ruddy complexion was attended by two companions, and the second, who was fairer and of shorter stature, by three. Thus in all there were seven, he left no record as to whether their heads were covered. They were about forty years of age, but they did not appear to be above thirty. When asked who they were, they said that they were men composed, as it were, of air, and subject to birth and death. It was true that their lives were much longer than ours, and might even reach to three hundred years duration. Questioned on the immortality of our soul, they affirmed that nothing survives which is peculiar to the individual. When my father asked them why they did not reveal treasures to men if they knew where they were, they answered that it was forbidden by a peculiar law under the heaviest penalties for anyone to communicate this knowledge to men. They remained with my father for over three hours. But when he questioned them as to the cause of the universe they were not agreed. The tallest of them denied that God had made the world from eternity. On the contrary, the other added that God created it from moment to moment, so that should he desist for an instant the world would perish. Be this fact or fable, so it stands. Nearly three centuries later, in September 1768, a young man of sixteen was traveling to the University of Leipzig with two passengers from Frankfurt. It rained most of the journey, and the coach sometimes had trouble moving uphill. On one occasion when the passengers had left their seats to walk behind the horses, 
the young man noticed a strange luminous object at ground level, all at once, in a ravine on the right hand side of the way, I saw a sort of amphitheater, wonderfully illuminated. In a funnel shaped space there were innumerable little lights gleaming, ranged step fashion over one another, and they shone so brilliantly that the eye was dazzled. But what still more confused the sight was that they did not keep still, but jumped about here and there, as well downwards from above as vice versa, and in every direction. The greater of them, however, remained stationary, and beamed on. It was only with the greatest reluctance that I suffered myself to be called away from the spectacle, which I could have wished to examine more closely. Now whether this was a pandemonium of will-o'-the-wisps, or a company of luminous creatures I will not decide. The young man in question was Gouda. You will find this sighting in the sixth book of his autobiography, according to movie director and occult scholar Kenneth Anger, to whom I am indebted for this very interesting discovery. Would the German poet and scientist have had occasion to learn more about the luminous creatures had he lived in the 20th century? If Paracelsus came back, would he find new material for his theories on the nature of the strange and fugitive races of beings from the sky? We can safely assume that their attention would be immediately attracted to the modern files of UFO landings and abduction reports. Return of the Humanoids One night in January 1958, a woman whose name I am not authorized to publish was driving along the New York State Thruway, in the vicinity of Niagara Falls, in the midst of a violent snowstorm. The exact time was 1.30 a.m. She was going to visit her son, then in the army, and she was driving very carefully, trying to find an exit, for she believed the thruway was closed ahead of her. Visibility was extremely bad. Hence she had no chance to think when she suddenly saw what seemed to be an airplane wreck on the center parkway, a large shape was visible, and a slim rod at least 50 feet high was illuminated and getting shorter as though it were sinking into the ground. My motor slowed down and as I came closer my car stopped completely. I became panicky and tried desperately to start it as I had no lights. My first thought was to get out and see what was happening but I suddenly saw two shapes rising around that slim pole which was still growing shorter. They were suspended but moving about it. They seemed to be like animals with four legs and a tail but two front feelers under the head, like arms. Then, before I could even gasp the things disappeared and the shape rose and I then realized it was a saucer, it spun and zoomed about ten feet off the ground and up into the air and I could not even see where it went. My lights suddenly came on. I started the car and it was all right. I pulled up to that place, got out with a flashlight and walked over to where it had been sitting. A large hole was melted in the snow about a foot across and grass was showing on it. The grass was warm, but nothing was dug up around there. The woman, who met only with disbelief when she told her story to her family, reported the case in a letter to my correspondent Otto Binder when his syndicated series Our Space Age began to appear in a number of newspapers. The most puzzling element in this account is not so much what is described but the fact that such stories have become, since 1946, rather common in all parts of the world. To a physicist, of course, they appear unbelievable just as a strange mannequin met by St. Anthony would appear unbelievable to a biologist. And yet there are several cases on record in which similar accounts are associated with traces that can hardly be questioned. In the celebrated incident at Socorro, New Mexico, it was a policeman, Lonnie Zamora, who reported seeing two small beings, dressed in white, close to a shiny egg-shaped object, which rested on four pads before it took off with a thunderous noise only to become perfectly silent as it flew away. The incident took place on April 24, 1964, and was the occasion for some interesting measurements, by local police officials and a Federal Bureau of Investigation man, of the traces left by the object. Here again we observe an emotional pattern strangely reminiscent of the medieval scene just surveyed, the witness in the Socorro case, when he was about to be interviewed by Air Force investigators, was so little convinced that he had observed a device of human construction that he asked to see a priest before releasing his report to the authorities. Another case hard to discount is the report of the Kentucky family who claimed to have been besieged by several little men, whose appearance was completely fantastic. The incident occurred on the night of April 21, 1955, and was the occasion of many strange observations of the behavior of the visitors. 
One of the creatures was seen approaching the farmhouse with both hands raised. When it was about 20 feet away, two of the witnesses shot at the intruder. It did a flip and was lost in the darkness. Then it appeared at the window when the man came back inside the house and was again shot at. Another creature, seen on the roof, was knocked over by a bullet, but instead of falling, it floated to the ground. The entities had oversized heads, almost perfectly round, and very long arms, terminating in huge hands armed with talons. They wore a sort of glowing aluminium suit, which is reminiscent of the sylphs of 1491. Their eyes were very large and apparently very sensitive. They always approached the house from the darkest corner. The eyes had no pupils and no eyelids. They were much larger than human eyes and set on the side of the head. The creatures generally walked upright, but when shot at, they would run on all fours with extreme rapidity, and their arms seemed to provide most of the propulsion. On September 10, 1954, in Corubal, a small French village near the Belgian border, at about 10.30 p.m., Marius D. Wilde stepped outside and was at once intrigued by a dark mass on the railroad tracks. D. Wilde then heard footsteps. Turning on his light, he found himself facing two beings wearing very large helmets and what seemed to be heavy diving suits. They had broad shoulders, but D. Wilde did not see their arms. They were less than four feet tall. D. Wilde moved toward them with the intention of intercepting them, but a light appeared on the side of the dark object on the tracks, and he found he could not move. When he regained control of his body, the two visitors had entered the supposed machine and flown away. This classic observation had a strange sequel, never before published. French civilian investigators who studied the case were cooperating closely with local police officials, but there were other people on the site, notably representatives of the air police from Paris. When an inquiry was made regarding some stones found calcined, or white hot, at the spot where the saucer had been seen by D. Wilde, it was discovered that even the police could not obtain information as to the results of the analyses. In the words of the local police chief, the official body working in liaison with the air police belongs to the Ministry of National Defense. The very name of this ministry excludes the idea of any communication. On November 19, 1954, the police confirmed that D. Wilde had made a second report concerning an observation of an object in the vicinity of his home. However, the police said, D. Wilde and his family have decided, for fear of adverse publicity, to take no one in their confidence regarding this second occurrence. Therefore you will find no mention of it in local newspapers. Furthermore, civilian investigators were told, politely but in no uncertain terms, that any further information on such incidents would be kept confidential by the police. Reports continued, however, and some of them would have delighted Paracelsus. On October 14, 1954, a miner named Starovsky claimed to have met, on a country road near Urchin, also in the north of France, a strange being of small height and bulky figure with large slanted eyes and a fur-covered body. The midget, less than four feet tall, had a large head and wore a brown skullcap, which formed a fillet a few inches above the eyes. The eyes protruded, with very small irises, the nose was flat, the lips were thick and red. A minor detail, the witness did not claim he had seen the creature emerge from a flying saucer or re-enter it. He just happened to meet the strange being, who did not wear any kind of respiratory device. Before he could think of stopping him, the creature had disappeared. Six days later, on October 20, 1954, in Paravisi Derba, near Como, Italy, a man had just put his car in the garage when he saw a strange being, covered with a luminous suit, about four feet tall, standing near a tree. When he saw the motorist, the creature aimed a beam from some sort of flashlight at him, paralyzing the witness until a motion he made when clenching the fist holding the garage keys seemed to free him. He rushed to attack the stranger, who rose from the ground and fled with a soft whirring sound. The author of this unbelievable story was 37 years old and was known locally as a trustworthy man. He arrived home in a state of great shock and went to bed with a high fever. The details of the case were obtained through an investigation by the Italian police. Eleven years later a new flurry of reports began. On July 1, 1965, Maurice Mass, a French farmer who lived in Valençol, 
arrived in his field at 6 a.m. and was getting ready to start his tractor when he heard an unusual noise. Stepping into the open, he saw that a machine had landed in his lavender field. He thought it must be some sort of prototype and walked toward it, with a mind to tell the pilots, in no uncertain words, to go find another landing spot for their contraption. It was only when he was within 20 feet of the machine that he came in full view of the scene and realized his mistake. The object was egg-shaped, had a round cockpit, was supported by six thin legs and a central pivot, and was not bigger than a car. In front, appearing to examine a plant, were the two pilots. They were dressed in one piece, gray-greenish suits. On the left side of their belts was a small container, a larger one was on the right side. They were less than four feet tall and had human eyes, but their heads were very large. They had practically no mouth, only a very small opening, without lips. They wore no respiratory device, no headgear, and no gloves. They had small, normal hands. When mass came upon them, they seemed to become suddenly aware of his existence, and yet it was without any indication of fear or surprise that one of the pilots took a small tube from its container and pointed it at Mass, with the result that the witness found himself suddenly incapable of movement. The two entities looked at Mass and appeared to be exchanging their impressions vocally in a sort of gargle. These sounds came from their throats, insisted the witness, but the mouths did not move. The eyes, in the meantime, conveyed human expressions. In private, Mass told me that he had not been frightened by their attitude and that it contained more friendly curiosity than hostility toward him. After some time, estimated by Mass at about one minute, the creatures went inside the craft. The door closed like the front part of a wooden file cabinet, but Mass could still see them through the cockpit. They were facing him as the object took off in the opposite direction, first hovering a few feet from the ground, then rising obliquely with the takeoff speed of a jet plane. When it was about 60 yards away, it vanished. I closely questioned the witness on this last point, but Mass insisted he could not say whether the object went away so fast that the eye could not follow it or whether it actually disappeared. He made it quite clear, however, that one moment, the thing was there, and the next moment, it was not there anymore. Mass remained alone in his field, paralyzed. The word paralysis is not properly used in connection with incidents of this type. Mass said that he was conscious during the whole observation. His physiological functions, respiratory, heartbeat, were not hampered. But he could not move. Then he became very frightened indeed. Alone in his field, unable even to call for help, Mass thought he was going to die. It was only after about 20 minutes that he gradually regained voluntary control of his muscles and was able to go home. There is a sequel to his experience. For several weeks after the incident, Mass was overcome with drowsiness, and all his relatives, as well as the investigators, observed that he needed so much sleep that he found it difficult to stay awake even for four hours at a time. This is another little known characteristic of close proximity cases. To Mass, who was used to working from sunup to sundown, this was a very impressive and disturbing consequence of his experience. Another result of the publicity the case attracted was the great damage to Mass's field, as crowds of tourists gathered to see the traces left by the craft. At this point, I should say that Mass is a man respected in the community. A former resistance fighter, a conscientious and successful farmer, he is regarded as absolutely trustworthy by the police authorities who investigated the case under the direction of Captain Valnet, of Dina. Yet this man tells us a story that does not simply appear fanciful, it is completely unbelievable. What is Mass's impression of the visitors? For some reason, he says, he knows they meant no harm, they were not hostile to him, only indifferent. As he stood facing them, during that long minute, he suddenly was overcome with the certitude that they were good, a belief he is unable to rationalize, because at no point did he understand their strange language. The story is fantastic. Yet it reminds us of the account Barney and Betty Hill gave under hypnosis of their alleged abduction in New Hampshire. On their way back from vacationing in Canada in September 1961, they had seen a strange light over the White Mountains. It came close to the road, and they next remember being in their car some 60 miles south, without any memory of the intervening travel time. 
Under hypnosis they remembered a long sequence of events involving abduction by small beings and a medical examination. The account included a description of an alien language, of entities whose expressions were almost human, of an overwhelming feeling of confidence, and of not the slightest indication that the incident had a meaningful purpose or followed an intelligent pattern. Of considerable interest to the psychologist is the fact that the entities are endowed with the same fugitiveness and behave with the same ignorance of logical or physical laws as the reflection of a dream, the monsters of our nightmares, the unpredictable witches of our childhood. Yet their craft do leave deep indentations in the ground, according to observers who were fully awake and absolutely competent at the time of sighting. These indentations have been photographed and measured in hundreds of cases. What does it all mean? How can one reconcile these apparently contradictory facts? Some, in a laudable attempt, question the classical search for patterns, is it necessarily true, they ask, that we would detect meaningful patterns, in the same sense of our own intelligence level, in the behavior of a superior race? Is it not much more likely that we would find in their actions only random data and incoherent pictures, much as a dog would have confronted with a mathematician writing on a blackboard. If so, it is only after new concepts have emerged in our own consciousness that we could discover the meaning of their presence in our environment. And, if a superior race does in fact generate what we are now observing as the UFO phenomenon, perhaps it is precisely with the purpose of changing the course of human destiny by presenting us with evidence of our limitations in the technical, as well as the mental, realm. Children of the unknown, if they are not real, should we see these rumors as a sign that something in human imagination has changed, bringing into a new light uncharted areas of our collective unconscious? They may be only children of our fancy, and our interest toward them akin to our love for Batman and Cinderella. But they may be real. Modern science rules over a narrow universe, one particular variation on an infinite theme. In any case, it is important to understand what need these images fulfill, why this knowledge is both so exciting and so distressing to us. Such is the subject of this book. 2. Winged Discs and Crispy Pancakes We have just established that a close parallel exists between modern claims of UFO contact and age-old traditions that involved alien spiritual entities. But how closely are these stories related? Can we be sure that we are really witnessing the continuation of the same current, the re-emergence of the same underground stream? In this chapter we will go below the surface of the stories and draw precise parallels between the physical observations made in earlier times and those that characterize modern close encounters. These physical manifestations include the shape of the flying objects, their representation as wing discs, the beings associated with them, the beams of light they can manipulate, the alteration of the sense of time they produce, and the peculiar characteristics of the interaction between human witnesses and entities. Often the dialogue has an absurd quality that conveys not a literal fact but a higher, symbolic truth. And this absurdity carries over to the objects exchanged with the occupants and even the physical traces they leave, rings of flattened grass, burned ground, areas of extreme pressure. Until we have formed a clear understanding of these patterns and recognize that they were already found in the accounts of antiquity and medieval times, we cannot hope to make sense of the UFO phenomenon. A universal fact. The problem before us now is this, if the reality behind the UFO phenomenon is both physical and psychic in nature, and if it manipulates space and time in ways our scientific concepts are inadequate to describe, is there any reason for its effects to be limited to our culture or to our generation? We have already established that no country has had the special privilege of these manifestations. Yet we must carry the argument further, if the UFO phenomenon is not tied to social conditions specific to our time, or to specific technological achievements, then it may represent a universal fact. It may have been with us, in one form or another, as long as the human race has existed on this planet. Something happened in classical times that is inadequately explained by historical theories. The suggestion that the same thing might be happening again should make us extremely interested in bringing every possible light to bear on this problem. Beginning in the second century BC and continuing until the fall of the Roman Empire, the intellectual elites of the Mediterranean world, raised in a spirit of scientific rationalism, 
were confronted and eventually defeated by a rational element similar to that contained in modern apparitions of unexplained phenomena, an element that is amplified by their summary rejection by our own science. It accompanied the collapse of ancient civilizations. Commenting on this parallel, French science writer Amy Michel proposes the following scene. Consider one of the Alexandrian thinkers, a man like Ptolemaeus, the second century astronomer thoroughly schooled in the rational methods of Archimedes, Euclid, and Aristotle. And imagine him reading the Apocalypse, various writings about Armageddon. How would he react to such an experience? He would merely shrug, says Amy Michelle. It would never occur to him to place the slightest credence in such a compendium of what must regard as insanities. Such a scene must have taken place thousands of times at the end of classical antiquity. And we know that every time there was the same rejection, the same shrugging, because we have no record of any critical examination of the doctrines, ideas, and claims of the counterculture that expressed itself through the apocalypse. This counterculture was too absurd to retain the attention of a reader of Plato. A short time, a very short time, elapsed, the counterculture triumphed, and Plato was forgotten for a thousand years. Could it happen again? Only a thorough examination of the ancient records can save us from the effects of such cultural myopia. Among other interesting objects, some of the artifacts that have come to us from Phoenicia provide insight into the idea of contact in antiquity. Phoenician Amulets History books tell us that the Phoenician civilization was established long before the Hebrew migrations, when several Semitic tribes founded a series of cities on the Mediterranean littoral. The main ones were known as Tyre, Sidon, Tripoli, and Byblus, and each was governed by an oligarchy or by a king. At the height of its development, Phoenicia itself extended through that part of Syria that goes from Nar al-Kabir, Eleutherus, on the north to Mount Carmel on the south. Sir E. Wallace Budge, one of this century's most distinguished scholars of Egypt and Mesopotamia, states that the Phoenicians were not a literary people. Unlike most Semitic peoples, they loved the sea. They used their abundant forests to supply timber for their ships. Their work was exceptionally refined and their products were sold by their merchants throughout the ancient world, in Europe, Asia, Africa, and India. They had learned from Babylon the art of dyeing, from Egypt the craft of glass blowing, and they used accurate systems of weights. Little is known of their religious beliefs, although it is often pointed out, on linguistic grounds, that the names of their gods show direct Babylonian, Egyptian, and Greek influences. Of their ritual practices we are told that they sacrificed their firstborn children in times of trouble, that they killed their prisoners of war on the altars of their gods, and that their women surrendered their virginity in the sanctuaries of Astarte. For their personal magical protection the Phoenicians appear to have adopted the type of amulets used in Babylonia and Assyria, and a collection of cylinder seals has been preserved in the British Museum. Some of these artifacts, which are shown in Wallace Budge's book Amulets and Superstitions, may date from a few centuries BC, probably from about 400 to 300 BC five of these cylinder seals depict a winged disc, often with appendages. Figures that are referred to in the literature as divine beings are seen emerging from these discs in four cases. And in every one of them human figures in ceremonial dress appear to be involved in rituals that contain Assyrian features. The first cylinder seal shows a hero holding in each hand the foreleg of a winged beast. One of these two beasts has horns on its head and a tail. Above the human being is the winged disc, from which a god is emerging. A Hira Mazda or some Assyrian god, writes Sir Wallace Budge, the interpretation of the second amulet involves scorpion men and sexual symbols. It is apparent that two strange creatures, obviously male, are supporting a winged disc above a sacred tree. To the right is a worshipper, while another person is bringing some sort of animal as a sacrifice. Here, again, two divine figures are to be seen, emerging from the disc. In the third amulet two large winged figures, classically interpreted as priests wearing winged garments, frame a large disc with extended legs. Directly beneath the disc is a symbol of lightning or a thunderbolt, before which a man appears to be standing in adoration. There is something on top of the disc. Another artifact, a sphinx and a goat stand on either side of a sacred tree above which is a winged disc. 
Two men are performing a ritual in connection with the scene. In the last amulet two of the strange dwarfish figures, which authorities call scorpion men, despite their large breasts on this particular seal, are supporting a winged disc from which project the heads of three divine beings. Two men are in adoration before the disc, beneath which a sort of vaulted door can be seen. To the left is a very strange figure interpreted as a god holding a gazelle or goat under each arm. The interpretation of this collection of artifacts raises several questions, because the classical statement that the flying disc is simply a primitive representation of the sun or the soul leaves much to be desired. Is it common for the winged disc, a frequent symbol in antiquity, to show several beings emerging from its upper part? In what context are such representations encountered? If the disc is interpreted as some mythological symbol connected with the cosmos, as is indicated by the abundance of astronomical designs in the seals, stars, crescent moons, should we speculate that the representation of a disc with extended claws may in fact seek to preserve the memory of a vision, or observation, of a flying craft capable of landing? This speculation does not answer all our questions but it provides a stimulating avenue of research into ancient symbolism. It is certainly fascinating to read the best accepted interpretation for the zigzag symbol in some of the amulets is lightning or a thunderbolt. Why should a thunderbolt be associated with a winged disc, and why should three people in elaborate magical garments stand in adoration before it? The scene suggests plan and purpose rather than a chance occurrence of some purely natural phenomenon. It suggests overt contact with a flying craft. Equally fascinating to the student of close encounter cases are the scenes in which animals are carried to the hovering disc. In one case, a god is seen holding a horned animal under each arm, a scene certainly reminiscent of many a claim of animal kidnapping by UFO occupants. Three of the cylinder seals show approximately the same thing, a disc above some elaborate ground structure, a human in adoration, and someone bringing a horned animal toward the center of the scene. The beings themselves fall into the following categories, human beings that Assyriologists call worshippers, priests, kings, etc. Sometimes they are wearing winged garments. The gods. They are shown either emerging from the disc and wearing, in some cases, elaborate headdresses or walking outside the disc, as in one amulet where an entity seems to be wearing its hair in three long tresses on either side of the head. The scorpion men, who have large phallic attributes in one figure but in another case would more properly be called scorpion women. They are only seen supporting the disc. It would be interesting to find out where the word scorpion comes from in connection with these figures. The scorpion men are consistently about two-thirds the size of men, who in turn are smaller than the gods. Professor Douglas Price Williams of UCLA points out that in the Gilgamesh epic the scorpion creatures were the guardians of the mountain of the sun. The scorpion man in the Babylonian Enuma Elish was a monster created by chaos at the beginning of the world. Price Williams adds, these creatures would thus be Tellurian beings, Donic as Jung would have said. That is the end of Dimensions, a casebook of alien contact part 2. A book by Jacques Vallée. Please proceed to part 3, before YouTube deletes it. Thank you for listening.